Hi, my name is Ingrid Piller and I come to you from Sydney in Australia. It's a great pleasure for me to be able to speak to you at the approaches to Migration Language and Identity Conference today. The topic I have set out for myself is to speak about religious conversion and migrant integration. Why is that relevant, you might wonder. Um, in the, I've been doing research in the migrant language learning space and migrant integration and how institutions adapt to the presence of a linguistically diverse population over about 20 years. And during these years, we, my team and I have spoken and followed the language learning and settlement experiences of over 500 migrants to Australia from a wide variety of backgrounds. And one thing that has stood out to us over all this research is that irrespective of background, um, the initial settlement phase can be deeply traumatic for new migrants. Um, they often speak about their initial experience of loneliness, of depression, of all kinds of economic challenges, of finding work and so on and so forth. The quote I've got here every day is a struggle is from one of the earliest research projects I did with um, international students as new arrivals in Australia in 2000. And it is a, a, a saying, kind of an expression of their feelings that I've heard echoed again and again. At the same time, my team and I have over the past years increasingly observed in the linguistic landscape of Sydney, the emergence of bilingual signage on churches. The two examples I've got here are from two different Sydney suburbs. Um, churches are one of the most provide one of the most linguistically diverse and bilingual linguistic landscapes just from the outside, the way their buildings look. One thing I need to say about the um, images I'm showing you here, the participants I'm going to talk about later do not attend these churches or um, the images that you see. So there is um, no connection and the participants are anonymous and they don't attend any of the churches of which I'm showing you images. So um, there is this kind of interesting, interesting observation, or we started out with this interesting observation that um, migrant settlement is so fraught at the same time, and, and um, secular institutions don't really do much to help migrants integrate in their initial settlement phase, but at the same time, there seem to be all these bilingual churches who are offering services, as you can see here in Chinese or Korean and many other languages. So um, what I'm going to talk about specifically today is actually to examine how conversion to Christianity can contribute to migrant settlement and what we can learn from that um, for migrant integration and sec in secular institutions. Um, I'm drawing specifically on my work that's been published in two books. You see the um, images here and um, specifically on work I've done together with my former PhD student, Ining Wang, and um, much of which will be published in a book chapter that comes out early next year about Christian bilingual practices and hybrid identities in a volume on language and spirit, exploring languages, religion, and spirituality in Australia. Much of the work I'm drawing on is also available through um, the migration, keywords that we have on our research blog where we've um, got over 200 um, research blog posts related to the language challenges of migration and that's an ongoing archive where you can look up anything that sort of interests you or that you want to follow up in what I'm talking about here. So um, I'm going to start with arrival as a crisis, the various crises of um, arrival, then conversion as a turning point, um, how our participants talked about consolidating new hybrid identities and um, 
experiences of migrant parenting, and finally move on to um, secular lessons for migrant integration. The work really draws um, very much on Inning Wang's PhD study, which was um, about the um, heritage language learning of Chinese um, migrant children, and had nothing to do with religion. Christianity um, did not sort of enter our, our research for a very long time. However, in that particular study that I just mentioned, in Ying Wang's PhD thesis about heritage language maintenance, um, Christianity really was um, a problem for the parents. And they kept talking or express an interest. Eight out of 31 partic family participants in that study had actually converted to Christianity since coming to Australia. And that's roughly equivalent to um, the percentage of Chinese Australians who are converts to Christian or who are, who are Christian and espouse the Christian faith. Um, the reason Christianity was such a popular topic among the families in Wang's research was that the participants really struggled with parenting in Australia. They did not want to raise their children in the kind of strict Chinese ways they had experienced themselves, but at the same time, they were really worried about Western parenting and saw, saw that as a kind of threat to their authority. And um, that's where Christianity became interesting to them because they kind of saw it as a way to provide guidance to their children in, um, in an overall environment that seemed difficult to them and, and, and that created challenges for them. So the specific research we are drawing on here are um, families from that from one study and then um, families we interviewed for another study um, that had to do with school home school communication during the COVID-19 pandemic and particularly during last year's school closures here in New South Wales. So in total, um, 57 Chinese families, we draw on the experiences of 57 Chinese families with school aged children. And um, specifically for um, this presentation, we re-interviewed um, and spoke again with another, with five women in those studies, five, uh, no, excuse me, seven, seven um, women, seven mothers in these studies who um, specifically about their experiences of conversion, because as I said, that conversion and Christianity had not been a focus of our previous studies, but was something that loomed really large in both these studies. So um, the participants specifically are born between were born between 1961 and 1982. That means they they just came of age really during China's economic opening up and the reform. So they grew up around the reform era of 1978 and and really saw China's economic progress. They all migrated to Australia between 2000 and 2015 when they were in their late 20s um, to their late 40s. All of them are highly educated and hold at least a bachelor's degree, which they obtained in China. So um, prior to migration, all of them worked in professional roles in engineering, finance, IT, medicine. After migration, they all experienced downward occupational mobility. And um, by the time of the, um, the specific religion focused interviews in 2020, they had all been in the country for a minimum of five years and up to 20 years. Um, during that time, none of them had managed to reestablish themselves at the same kind of professional level that they had back in China. All of them um, had been raised as atheists in China, but converted to Christianity within the first few years of settlement in Australia. And um, in 2020, they attended a variety of Christian congregations, mostly of the, or all of them of a Pentecost, Pentecostal and evangelical persuasion. 
So let's now look at the crisis of the of arrival as they experience them. So this group could be described um, as lifestyle migrants, if you will. Um, so in a sense, the people I'm talking about right now are probably among the most privileged migrant groups in terms of their class, in terms of their financial position, in terms of their education, in terms of the choice they have, including the choice to return their country of origin. And so um, keep that in mind when I'm talking about the fact that migration was deeply traumatic for this particular group. And um, as I said, many of the other migrant groups we've been talking to over the years, they have been far less fortunate. And um, so for them, the trauma of arrival is really even more pronounced. So these crises of arrival relate to economic insecurity. And that's a key finding, um, not only from our research, but from research in a great variety of contexts that migration typically for a large majority of uh, migrants, particularly um, those who are well educated and the professional professional migrant involves downward education, a uh, downward socioeconomic mobility. So for our participants, um, migration really involved a transition from enjoying stable professional careers in China to, um, to an inability to find employment at their level in Australia. And that really came as a deep shock for them. And um, this deep shock kind of related to other challenges that created a crisis, like practical settlement challenges, like, you know, even things like how to um, set up an email account in um, a new environment was one of the questions or how to have the, the power connected. So really practical mundane problems that um, could, if there was no support available, quickly spiral out of control. One of, and this related to language and communication problems as well, that um, some of the participants really felt um, like their agency, their expertise, their sense of themselves as competent adults had been taken away from them simply because um, they could not express themselves as eloquently as they wished, or, and you know, this goes together as kind of a dialectical relationship, they were not treated as competent adults by their interlocutors. All these problems together seriously affected also their family relationships. So there was a lot of um, marital crisis, problems between husband and wife, um, marriage breakdown and lots of feelings of guilt vis-a-vis -vis their children, that they were neglecting their children. Um, one of the women said, you know, we, we felt broken both emotionally and physically. And um, because they then started a grocery store and had to work like lots long hours, they said, you know, I, I felt so guilty because um, our child was so lonely. So this existential crisis um, that migration and the initial settlement phase pre constituted for our participants um, was also the beginning of their religious seeking. And um, many of them used exactly the same phrase in Chinese, Ren de Jing Tao, which literally means the end of humans. It's like ultimate hopelessness. And, and, and when you experience ultimate hopelessness, the, the divine comes in or um, it's the beginning of God. It's the beginning of their spiritual seeking. Um, now, as I said already, um, I, I've showed you pictures of bilingual churches um, uh, at the same time, all over Sydney, you can also see lots of billboards where um, Chinese, where various churches advertise, advertise their services or their congregations bilingually. So um, 
although I've just said, you know, that's the, uh, the end of humans, hopelessness is the beginning of spiritual seeking, all of our participants started their religious conversion journey actually um, as, a, as a practical matter. And they were readily to uh, readily admitted that they were not actually seeking God. They were seeking practical support in the crisis they were experiencing. They wanted to make new friends. They um, wanted to create new networks for themselves that could fill in the gap in networks and relationships and the loss of extended family that had been created through migration. And um, they spoke about their new churches really as family, as church brothers and church sisters. One of them said, when I go to church on a Sunday, I, I don't go to church, I go to see my family. And so, church really became that new family. Um, the practical assistance that these church communities offered helped to build, um, you know, supportive, trusting relationships, and they compensated partly for the loss of family and friendship networks. Um, one thing that the churches did and, and a service that they really appreciated was that um, Churches mediated in marital conflict and um, like often the minister's wife, for instance, would reach out to couples and um, help them resolve difficulties. But not only the practical support really improved their relationships, um, it was also that the, their new belief systems helped them to improve their relationships. Um, for instance, one participant said, and I'll read that out to you, we were touched when we listened to the lectures on marriage. The minister said if both husband and wife consider themselves as God or goddess, they will fight to prove who is stronger, right? But if both listen to the real God, they will not fight. Our relationship um, improved gradually, we quarreled less. Um, and so that gave us the conviction that God exists. You see, we could not have solved our problems by ourselves, but if you trust in God and listen to him, it is easy. So many of the participants really credited their Christian beliefs with saving their marriage. And, and they kind of argued that, in fact, the strong position they had enjoyed as Chinese women or um, gender equality was one of the, um, of the problems that, that had created initial crises. And so um, there was a real gender transformation going on. When we had the book chapter, I mentioned to you that this is based on one of the um, peer reviewers said to us that actually the idea of male headship is not something that is apparent or that, that is mainstream Christianity these days. And for our participants, um, the idea of male headship was actually part of the transformation they experienced and something they felt they needed to accept to make their initial settlement or to make their settlement experience a positive one and to repair their family relationships. Um, and I have to add, this sounds like, um, you know, this might be a Christian thing. In fact, um, it's not only a, a pro, the, the, how should I call it, the challenge to gender equality that these migrants experienced when they came from China to Australia um, is not unique to these particular migrants and it's not unique to um, those who convert to Christianity or engage in any kind of religious practice. It's actually part of um, the way the migration system is set up because typically the visa goes to a primary visa holder and um, then members of that family become secondary visa holders for various reasons, um, often because they are better, um, more highly qualified or because they are the breadwinners, men tend to be the primary visa holder. So this kind of transformation of um, 
gender equality towards making women secondary in the process of migration is something that can be observed in migration internationally and that um, I've written about in some detail together with my colleague Loy Lissing with regards to migrants from the Philippines, for instance, um, where the husband is set up as the primary visa holder and the wife then gets a secondary visa holder, not only as family member, but also to work as a packer in the abattoirs we were investigating then. Um, having said all that, the, um, these Christian believe the, the uh, male headship was not the only Christian belief that the participants found problematic. Um, they similarly uh, chafed at the idea originally even of a transcendental deity. I mean, they have been raised as atheists. So um, the idea of a deity was very far away from them. Um, so conversion really constituted a complete break with their strong socialization into atheism and um, a scientific worldview. One of the participants, for instance, said, I told the minister that I am an atheist and um, I believe in the Big Bang Theory as the beginning of the universe and I believe in evolution. These are the three cornerstones of my life. Um, even so, she found that the, um, the support and the network and the human fellowship that the church offered her was actually such that she couldn't tear herself away. And then she ended up seeing that as the work of God and, uh, and proof of the existence of God, which actually then overrides atheism and the scientific worldview. One way to reconcile their new beliefs with um, their former identities was then not to focus on problematic and contradictory beliefs like beliefs in gender equality or the belief in the scientific worldview, but rather um, values and beliefs where Chinese and Christian values really overlapped and they were related to moral teachings in particular. So many of the participants quoted to us proverbs and sayings um, like from the Confucian Analects and saying these are all compatible with Christianity. So examples were, for instance, um, the saying, the Chinese saying, the grace of drops is repaid by the spring, which is an exhortation to gratitude. And they said, you know, see, this is a Chinese proverb, but it's exactly what uh, compatible with Christian teachings. Or another one um, that says there are gods seven feet above our head, which is basically the equivalent of God is watching. Um, or another one that says, out of any three people, there is one who can be your teacher. This is a warning against arrogance. And so again, same teachings in the, in the Chinese tradition and in the Christian tradition. Overall, espousing these new beliefs and engaging with a new set of people, finding community within in the church resulted, as the participants put it, in a complete life transformation. And one they experienced as highly positive and um, as strengthening them and as giving them a new outlook on life and um, making their settlement journey, their migration journey, but also their life journey, one that was successful and meaningful. So they spoke about this complete life transformation. Now, um, at the time of the interviews in 2020, the average time since baptism was more than 10 years for the participants. And so this means that these initial crises and the traumas of um, arrival of early settlement were really in the past for them. And they had managed to consolidate new positive identities um, 
to become comfortable in their new identities as um, Chinese English bilinguals, as Chinese Australians. The image I've got here on the slide is actually um, an image that Google, Google Map brings up when you type in um, a Chinese evangelical church in Sydney. And so it just gives you an image of the fairly large number of churches and congregations we are talking about. So um, what are these hybrid linguistic national new identities that they espouse? Well, the choice of medium was really, really important. And so what you see here is that these churches are really multilingual institutions. Um, most of the participants had attended Chinese medium churches at some point or maybe switched to English medium churches at a later point. But the churches themselves were really very pragmatic about um, language choice. Many of the churches that you see here on the map have um, English, Cantonese, and Mandarin ministries. So their multilingualism is really a key attraction. The Chinese language ministries, the Mandarin and Cantonese, are aimed at the first generation of worshippers, such as the parents we spoke to. Whereas um, the English language ministries are then aimed at the second generation who tend to be English dominant. And I'll get back to that in a second. Um, the, the key factor or, or another key point that the participants readily uh, again and again stressed about this bilingualism was that bilingualism really touched them in a holistic ways and in a holistic way and, and there was a deep attraction in listening both to English and Chinese language sermons, um, as well as to you know localized and globalized ones so, for instance. Um, one participant said, I'll read that out to you. The sermons in my current church, which is an English medium evangelical congregation, are mostly related to daily life in Australia, but Chinese ministers in America, and she was listening to all these ministries on the internet, um, they have experienced living in China and they frequently relate their sermons to events there. We identify with both sides, and that is why we want to listen to ministers from different backgrounds. So um, over time, they found that the different languages and, and styles touched them differently. Another one said, and I, I'll read that out to you too. I have my favorite English and Chinese pastors. The words of, and then she says the name of an English speaking minister. They are so full of passion and power that I can feel my heart beating. Chinese preachers are more traditional, but nonetheless excellent. Then she mentions a Chinese um, speaking minister and she says he puts a lot of humor in his sermons and the Chinese jokes and poems are very touching. So um, the churches really do speak holistically to migrants and um, or holistically to bilingual people. And I'll get back to that when I speak about lessons that secular institutions can draw from this study. Um, in the same way that both languages contributed to their spiritual development, their dual identities became fused to um, some of them experienced a strong sense of awakening of their Australian identity um, through the church. And it has to be noted that our current prime minister, um, Scott Morrison, is himself a Pentecostal Christian. And last year, during um, the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic, he was on TV praying for Australia. And one of the participants said that that was a really vital moment for her. At that moment, she says, I'll quote that to you, I realized I am Australian. I must serve both China and Australia. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. In some, what we can see is that the successful that successful migration is ultimately a fusion of different national linguistic and religious identities. It's an integration of languages, of identities, of belief systems, and the churches facilitated that integration. They allowed our participants to find a comfortable space for themselves as first generation migrants in Australia. However, 
grounding the next generation in such a comfortable hybrid identity was much more complicated. And I'll now turn to migrant parenting. Now, the key background information that you need here is um, the English dominance of the second generation. Um, this is something that we found in a number of study we've done here and that really everyone who's ever done any research with um, migrant languages and heritage language maintenance has pretty much found and across ethno linguistic groups that um, if not the second, the third generation is English dominant, even if bilingualism is maintained and the, the um, language learning outcomes of um, the vast majority of families in the study was of English dominant children. In particular, the children usually did not know how to read and write in Chinese. So um, literacy was a really large barrier to them um, accessing the Chinese tradition and Chinese discourses. So even if they, um, spoke the language orally and could communicate, they usually very rarely could write, read and write at um, high levels. And so the different linguistic repertoires of the parents and the children really often mean that parents and children in a migration context, context inhabit different discursive worlds. And there were gaps between the Chinese parents in quotation marks and their Australian children in quotation marks. Now, this could lead to major frictions, particularly in the teenage years. And um, parents found that, you know, their, their Chinese values and discourses um, with regard to complex topics related to growing up related to a moral education, they, they really found it hard to um, reach their children this way. And so that's where the word of God came in quite handy because um, Christian values kind of became a way to infuse the desired moral values in their children and provide the kind of moral education they wish to provide not only by providing a vocabulary that the different generations shared, but also through the community of the church where raising children is or in the is shared in the congregation, if you will, where there were other young people, where there were role models that they could see their children aspire to and they were comfortable leaving their children, like let them go on camp with other Christian children, for instance, something they were not comfortable with the schools, with the secular schools. Um, and the, the, the key anxieties that the parents had were really related to uh, sexuality, to um, drugs, and um, alcohol and kind of what they saw as an overly promiscuous or, or liberal parenting style, a Western parenting style and, and a Western education. So one participant, for instance, said about her 17 year old son um, and why she wanted him and, and why she had educated him a Christian is if he fears God and has faith, we can use God's word to instruct him. Otherwise, children in Australia have too much so-called democracy, individual rights and freedoms. So um, Christianity was really an essential parenting tool. The most divisive issue really was around um, sexual orientation. And um, while same-sex uh, same relationships enjoy equality before the law in Australia and discrimination is illegal and they are widely recognized, um, homosexuality was only decriminalized in China in 1997 and negative attitudes towards same-sex relationships are known to persist. And this kind of gap really caused our participants significant anguish um, and, and something they were worried about for their children. 
and they really did not see how they, they did not see a bridge in this in, in secular society between their concerns and um, what they saw as dangerous attitudes on the part of wider Australian society. So um, participants generally were really comfortable in their bilingual and bicultural identities as Chinese and Australian. By the time we spoke to them, you know, a fairly long time into their migration journey, but at the same time, they really struggled to reconcile Chinese and Australian values, if you will, when it came to their parenting. Partly this is due to different linguistic repertoires. Um, they perceived Australia's individualistic culture as constituting a formidable threat to their parental authority. And they felt them that Christianity, they felt that Christianity allowed them to bridge that gap by providing an objective source of morals and um, uh, an objective compass, a moral reference. And so ironically, Christianity thus provided them with the vocabulary and the ability to instill um, to instill what they consider Chinese values in the second generation, um, a generation that by and large lacks the linguistic skills to access those Chinese values and discourses directly by reading the, lit the, the literatures in Chinese, for instance. So let me move on to my conclusion and the lessons this research holds for secular institutions. Um, one thing that I've stressed here is that the initial settlement phase is incredibly fraught and incredibly difficult. And so the significance of considering or of providing initial settlement support cannot be overestimated. Now, one thing that migrant receiving societies very often do actually is exclude particularly skilled migrants from any kind of social support services or welfare support in the precisely in the initial phase of settlement. As we have shown, this is the, the key time when services are needed actually or may be needed. And so um, because there is a lack of migrant settlement services, particularly for skilled migrants um, who are supposed to you know, go out on their own bed. In the initial phase, this is a gap that is being filled by the churches. Um, and and that, really, that, that really relates to a host of sometimes very mundane and in small seeming practical matter matters um, related to things like you know how to get the power connected but because these initial practical little difficulties kind of compiled and, and uh, were so many in the initial settlement phase they could spiral out of control and that that was the fundamental problem and then it really became a, a huge problem for their future trajectory and so that's where the churches came in and that's where we need migrant resource centers and migrant support services to come in and provide those kinds of practical levels of support, but also um, provide new opportunities to rebuild the networks and the family relationships that have been lost in the process of migration. So to provide new substitutes for human connection. So we really need to take seriously the, um, the initial settlement problems and the disorienting effects of having to establish new social networks from scratch as an adult. That is just really hard and people need help with that. And um, in contrast to secular institutions, which kind of say, you know, go, go and get out there, it's your own responsibility and this responsibilization that 
neoliberal responsabilization, if you will, that we see with secular services is something that the churches did not do and they welcomed and provide welcome these people and provided the kind of support and and gave them the fellowship they needed at that point in their lives now um, as i've shown this fellowship of course came at the price of a total identity transformation and at the price of accepting new beliefs new values um, you know, conversion, it came at the price of conversion. And obviously, this is not something we should be expecting anyone to do. Um, this should not, conversion should not be the price to pay for success, that people have to pay for successful integration, if you will. Not everyone can become a believer or wants to become a believer. And um, Here, what I've shown is that conversion and self-transformation really went hand in hand. Um, they had obvious benefits. They, they gave these people a comfortable space to live in, a comfortable new identity, a comfortable way to integrate into Australian societies. But um, of course, this practical settlement support and human fellowship cannot rest on um, conversion and on accepting a new belief system. So um, what did these Christian congregations do in addition to welcoming these people with open arms, in addition to providing fellowships? The linguistic lesson here is that they were linguistically incredibly pragmatic. So. Um, whether someone had high or low levels of proficiency in English was not a precondition to engage with the church. And um, on the contrary, as long as it didn't affect the overall doctrinal teaching, linguistically, the churches are incredibly pragmatic. And that stands in contrast to all our secular institutions which actually insist on the primacy of English. And you know, from schools to universities, to um, employment centers, to workplaces, whatever it is, secular institutions, by and large, take, they have a monolingual habitus in the words of Ingrid Gogolin, they, they, they espouse English only and thus, really make it impossible for some people to actually get into the institution and, and become full-fledged members over time. So to overcome the monolingual habitus of secular institutions is another important lesson that we need to learn from these conversion stories that um, I've shared with you today. So the monolingual habitus of multilingual societies remains a key barrier in the secular space and one that, you know, the churches can very well do without, they function very well without. So why should um, secular institutions not be able to function equally well multilingually? They're, there, in reality, it works. That's what the churches show us. Multilingualism in an institution works. Linguistic inclusivity can work um, to the benefit of the institution and its members. This is particularly a challenge with regards to schools, actually. So um, we've noted here persistent home school gaps. I mean, all parenting is challenging and, and migrant parenting may be even more challenging. But um, the, the, the gaps between parents and children really are to be the blame for these gaps is to be put at the education, the Australian education system. And there are two blames here. One is um, the overall failure to develop 
the bilingualism of migrant children and to ensure that they have high levels of proficiency in both the societal language, in both English and in the heritage language. So that actually um, migrant parents are fully equipped to um, socialize their children into a comprehensive identity. So we have the failure to um, develop bilingual skills that creates a gap between parents and children. And then we have the failure to um, engage diverse parents. Now, parental engagement is such a key to um, education, su ed educational success. However, um, as we've shown in other research, home Homeschool connections are really built on English only, on the ability of parents to receive information in English and to engage with the school community in English. Where that is lacking, there's, there's such a barrier. And that barrier really created or contributed at least to the fears that our participants had and, and the misapprehensions in many cases they had about um, the, the kind of Western education and the perils of Western education that they were so worried about. With that, um, I hope that you found this interesting. I will be very much looking forward to answering your questions and discussing this further. And um, I hope um, we'll be able to think more together about um, the, the kind of the, the many lessons that the, um, the way churches as institutions welcome new members hold for secular for secular institutions in a diverse society. With that, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>